Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another live stream. Today, we're talking about how to find a good reference photo. If you want to nerd out about art, Art Prof has everything you need from tutorials to critiques to a community of fellow art nerds. Clara, why is it so hard to find a good reference photo? You wouldn't think with everything that's available with Google Images that it would be hard, but it's really hard because the searches oftentimes they're actually really homogenous. For example, I just did a search for I on Pinterest, and it's a little creepy that they all have lots of makeup and they're all clearly people who are fairly young. And that's really frustrating as an artist. Is that for you? Right. All of these searches just kind of want to show you the most popular pick. And in the case of I, the most popular pic would, picture would be just a makeup glamorous eye, basically. <laughs> and things don't necessarily get better if you make the search more specific, because you could say, oh, well, I, that's so generic. But what I did next was I actually typed in older female eye into Pinterest. And you would think, oh, okay, now I'm gonna get better results. But here's the thing, they all still have makeup and they're all like Hollywood women, like Helen Mirren and all these glammed up actresses. And so it's like, wh where do you go when you want photos of like real people eyes? <laughs> we have to go to real life. I just feel like with these general searches, they're gonna give you the stereotype of what you search. So automatically, if you put female in something, you're probably going to get an eye with a lot of makeup. I mean, that's just how Google Images and Pinterest works. So if you want to find real life references, go to real life. <laughs> Maria says, companies and people post what, what works. They see the mold and repeat it. So to find something different is hard because, quote, art reference is not popular for search on the planet. Yeah, and a lot of companies copy each other. And so you end up with everything looking very similar. And so it's hard, it takes time, especially if you have something in your mind that's very specific that you're really looking for this one thing. It can be very hard. I mean, we have real eyes on mm -hmm. our reference photo collection, but maybe we don't have what you need. So it's very challenging. And, and Kat, what's the problem with a lot of photos today, especially in magazines? they're extremely manipulated via Photoshop. Like if you just look at this Vogue magazine, I don't think this person has that clear skin. <laughs> and that's just, it's tricky. It's tricky because you don't really know what's real and what's fake. You can just sort of assume it's all fake. And then how do you find a good reference for your artwork? And I think also we're so used to seeing these images that you don't really think about how fake they really are. I mean, she almost looks like a doll. Like nobody has skin like that. It's just very artificial looking. And you'll see the exact same thing in all of these fashion magazines. And it gets weird because Kat, I had this roommate in art school who only read fashion magazines. She was obsessed with them. And all her references for her illustrations were from fashion magazines and they looked really weird because she had this illustration, it was a waiter, a server, and he looked like a GQ model. Like it just did not work. <laughs> I wanna pull up this comment by Chukha Duong that says, I was surprised to find out that it really is true that young, quote, beautiful, unquote, faces are not all that interesting to draw. So, I mean, there can be beautiful faces that are interesting to draw, but like, what is beautiful? If you type in beautiful face into Google Images, you're going to get a very narrow result of what beauty is. So half agree. Like, I feel like a lot of beautiful faces, they all tend to look the same in the Google search because that is a very narrow search. Brittany says, I noticed the other day that polished photos make the face look really flat with the lighting and makeup. That's true because... Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes what makes a face look more natural is the quote flaws, like the freckles, the, mm -hmm. the wart. And those are all things that they just take out in these magazines. And it's not just that, they're also very staged. 
I mean, Dev Patel, he looks great here, but <laughs> it's so posed, right? <laughs> right. It's very posed. And it probably took a lot of shots, too, to get to this very picturesque image. Maria's saying, do you think it will be easier to pick up the real from the fake now that some countries have laws that demand that use of manipulation is to be disclosed on the images from the magazines? I'm not so sure people are looking that carefully. So even if there is disclosure somewhere in the magazine that explains it, I think unless you're really, in, if it, unless it's really important to you, I don't know that people would take that under consideration. I don't know. Um, I just don't think it's a good idea to accept things at face value. If you see an image, just know that, hey, there are multiple things in play here. It could be Photoshop. It could be a professional photographer. It could be a professional setup, lighting situation. So there are all these factors that you don't know what's going on behind that photo. And so what happens for all these reasons, oh, it can take so long to find a photo. I mean, you would not think it takes that long, but let's just look at this, okay? I just searched on Pinterest, hand writing a pencil. Look at all these problems. Like, mm -hmm. what's the issue here, Kat? <laughs> you can't see the full form of the hand. <laughs> it's the wrong angle. <laughs> the lighting's bad, it's blurry. You can't see the hand clearly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you get thousands of results. I feel that it's like going to a used clothing store where there's just so much clothing, but you have to wade through a lot of really bad outfits to find like one thing that's actually good. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, you'll get it eventually, but it takes so much longer than people think. Right. Tali is saying, what about using multiple photos to create a piece? I do that all the time. We will address it later in the stream too. But sometimes you do need, for instance, a hand from a very specific angle, in which case you might be able to find that hand in multiple images. Let me explain. So you might find a hand in one image and then you might find a pencil in another image and then have that hand hold that pencil. So yes, you can use multiple reference photos in that respect. And so really what we wanna do in the stream, we wanna show you how to find photos off of Google images, what to look for. But we also wanna tell you guys, if you need a picture of a hand, don't Google fist. <laughs> Google images. It's like, is it really that hard? You've got two arms. You've got a phone. Just take the photo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Let's go over some don'ts that we think will save you a lot of grief in terms of the actual drawing process. So the first one is using another artist's artwork as the reference. Why is this not a good idea, Kat? Even if it's like a really realistic looking painting. Well, you want to really avoid plagiarism. I mean, if you have an artwork and you make a very similar artwork, that is just direct plagiarism. You do not want to do that. And also, in a way, that artist has interpreted that image in a certain way, in a certain style, that if you just take that interpretation, you're not really going to, you can't take credit for that. I also think it's almost like making a Xerox of a Xerox. Inevitably, your Xerox of their Xerox is going to degrade in quality and it's not going to have a lot of the original raw visual information that is embedded in the original photo. Mm -hmm. So I just think I would avoid it entirely for all of those reasons. Mm -hmm. Let Our Vision Expand says, how much do you have to alter a reference image found online in order to use it safely in an illustration that will be published? That is a case by case basis. <laughs> I think sometimes if image is obscure enough, I think you can t heavily borrow from that image. 
but it would be a lot safer to take your own picture as reference. But in other cases, I think it's honestly your call. And I think it would be good to have multiple pairs of eyes on the piece. Just maybe present it to someone and then also present the reference photos and just ask other people, am I taking, am I borrowing too much from my reference or should I change it up a little bit more? So case by case basis. <laughs> Now, something you should definitely do is avoid really famous photos, all right? Like, this is a photo that's just everywhere. I think most people have seen it. But mm -hmm. what's the problem with using a photo like this, which a lot of people have seen? People will just automatically think of that photo. They're going to see your work. They're not going to see your hand as an artist. They're just going to say, oh, that is a famous photograph of my grandmother taken by Dorothea Lang, Lange, Lange. <laughs> but um, that aside, also it's just, again, it's such an iconic photo that you really need to think out of the box for your own piece. Like why would you want to have another iconic photo and just like copy it straight into your artwork? You want to have your own voice. You do not just want to copy somebody else's really powerful voice. Well, and here's another argument for shooting your own photos in addition to the concern about copyright. Katya says, if you take your own photos, you can get the exact angles you want without taking so much time looking. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, if you can shoot your own reference photo, it's faster and better than spending all this time on Google Images trying to find all that stuff. Using diagrams or charts, Kat, I've never understood why people would do this, but I see it all the time. Why do you think if you want to draw a picture of a person, you would draw from an anatomical chart? Well, I think people are lulled by the fact that it is like anatomically correct and therefore it must be the perfect pose to use. But in fact, it's extremely unnatural. The whole reason why the diagram exists is just to be very exact and point out things. They are not trying to tell a story or anything with that. And they're definitely not trying to tell the story you're trying to tell. <laughs> absolutely avoid this. And another thing that is my biggest pet peeve is people using those wooden armatures of figures to try to get the perfect pose because those wooden armatures are also super stiff and they're extremely unnatural. And there's nothing anatomically correct about them at all. Mm. At least is somewhat <laughs> there, but it's still, if you look at the contour of this figure, it's really stiff. It is not going to be a good reference for that. And so same thing, it's like go to the source, a real person that you can actually see the natural pose in. I wanna point out this comment by Angie that says, if I like a pose or something I see online, I'll make my friends and family copy the pose and I'll snap a picture of them. That's pretty, that's a safe move. <laughs> and I think another thing is that if there is a certain action going on in the scene, such as somebody running a marathon, getting somebody to run <laughs> and you take a picture in that certain angle or a certain dynamic that you saw in previous reference photos, that would also be really helpful. Well, it's tricky though, because I was actually talking to somebody the other day about their reference photo and they wanted somebody running and they had somebody pose, which is great. But the person went like this. You know, like, that's not what people look like when they run. That's somebody who's posing, pretending that they're running. And mm -hmm. so somebody posing isn't always the answer. I mean, sometimes it is, but it mm -hmm. depends. Gian says, I don't like using my own hands for a reference photo because my hands aren't as slicker and larger than I want it to be. But I feel like studying how to reconstruct it makes me learn how to. That's such a good point because... While it's good to have a good reference, there are certain things in references that don't matter. And oftentimes I will look at where my knuckles are in my hand, but maybe I'll make the fingers way longer because I don't have long fingers. <laughs> right, and adding on to that point, I think there is a big problem with artists of a specific physical body type using themselves as reference for everything. Like I have seen very short artists try to draw tall people with photos of themselves. And you can just tell from the drawing <laughs> that the artist is short because they don't know how to draw tall people. I've also had, I also have a friend who is heavier and she's trying to draw skinny people. 
And it is really hard to use a photo of herself in order to draw another kind of body. So in that case, I think that you have to know the limits of what you can reference from yourself. Sometimes you really do have to go out of your way and find the reference of like somebody with the body type you're looking to draw. Now, another interesting thing about references is it does not always have to be a literal reference. And this is a really great example. So this is an illustration that Jordan McCracken Foster, one of the teaching artists here, he did of one of his characters on this, what is this, a hoverboard? I don't know, it's, it's, it's some structure. I'll have to ask Jordan later on what it's called. And I guess, Kat, when I look at this illustration, I would think, oh, well, if I want a reference for this, I better get a picture of somebody like on a skateboard or somebody who's snowboarding. Like I, I need to have a board in there somewhere because that's part of the illustration. And yet Jordan did a figure skater. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, references and inspiration can come really from everywhere. I don't know how Jordan found this particular figure skater image, but maybe it was just out in the ethos and he saw it and he was like, wait, this would look so good with that <laughs> and happened to save it and use it as a reference. So really don't, of course, look for accuracy. If you were trying to draw a skateboard or a hoverboard, maybe take a picture of somebody on a skateboard or a, board or a hoverboard, but don't just be limited by that. Think outside of the box. Where else can you find dynamic poses? Exactly. And it's like, it made all the difference in the world. Because Kat, even if I could conceptualize a pose like this in my head, there's no chance I'd even get close. Because it's a really awkward looking pose. Mm -hmm. And yet everything down to the positioning of the fingers contributes to the pose being believable in his illustration. Right. All right. So let's review. What are qualities that you should look for in a good reference photo? Now, this slide is just a checklist for those of you to refer to later, but we're gonna show you some very concrete examples. So this is a stream, a draw along that Jordan and I did recently on how to draw noses. And I think you all know that I spend a lot of time finding particular photos for us to work from. I know it looks like they just appear out of the air, but they take so long to find cat. Like sometimes I just want to die because I'm like, Argh. like I want this one thing and I can't find it. Mm -hmm. So the first tip I would say is always search for large size files. Why does that matter? Because you want to get a clear view of what exactly you want to draw. So if you wanted to draw this person's nose, then if you just searched any size image, you could get like a really far away shot and you can barely see any facial features on this on this person. So if you find a large resolution image, you have a greater chance of being able to zoom in and see features and surfaces more clearly. Now, here are a bunch of photos of the actor Michael Clark Duncan, and we're just gonna explain to you why each one of these photos would have been rejected and how we eventually landed on the one that I did use for the stream. So what's funny about this cat is there are a lot of photos where there are some good qualities, but then there's other things, oh, I can't use it because of that. So can you explain this checklist for people? <laughs> right, so this image clearly has dramatic lighting. And of course we want to include that lighting and shadow can also tell a story in an, in, in an image, but it being blurry and the shadows being flat really takes away from the image because now you can't really tell what is going on in this man's face in the shadow area. That is just a pitch black shade. And how are you going to draw the fine details and surfaces in the areas that are in shadow and it's blurry. So you really need to find a high quality image. Just go into Google images, click the large image size, <laughs> and just use that. Yeah, and as Brittany says, it's always awful when you find something that could work and it's teeny tiny. I know, it's mm -hmm. like 150 pixels. You're like, <laughs> like it's that <laughs> right, folks. It's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so if you look at this one, this one, again, it's got dramatic lighting. Now, some of you might look at this and say, oh, well, the stream was to draw a nose. It doesn't matter that the eyes are covered in shadow. For me, it really did because my approach to drawing the nose is very much about contextualizing the nose. So for me, having a photo 
where the eyes are totally in shadow would have been really disruptive. Because I think the thing about a reference photo, it's always okay to have more information. But when you have something that's just missing, like no eyes because they're in shadow, mm -hmm. that can be a real problem. Now, mm -hmm. how about this one, Kat? I mean, same thing as you said before, the chin is cropped <laughs> and you want to contextualize that nose on the entire face. The lighting is also very flattening. It looks like a flash, like straight directly into the face. So it doesn't have a lot of dramatic, dramatic lights and shadows, but it is in focus. So I guess you can see the surface of the nose <laughs> and the texture of the skin. Well, to be clear about the lighting, there's good highlights, but there's not good shadows. That's mm -hmm. the difference. And so you really need to have both for that to work. Pagarami says the Green Mile, is that the film? Yes, it's that film with Tom Hanks. It was made a while ago. It's kind of a hard movie to watch, but it's really good if you want something that's dramatic. Okay, so why did this make the cut, Cat? I mean, look at the list. It checks everything. <laughs> Good lighting, good shadow, good resolution. Nothing is cropped. You see the whole head. Um, that being said, what we are looking specifically right now for is a good reference photo for a nose. But that doesn't mean that the previous photos didn't have their merits as well. So if you are looking to maybe draw Michael Clark Duncan in maybe a slightly different angle or stylize it in some kind of way, I'd say all the images from before are valid reference photos. But in this particular case where we're just looking for the for Michael Clark Duncan's nose, this is the image that we would use for reference. Well, I mean, one of the reasons I like this photo cat, you have really nice dramatic highlights on the nose, but there's also that dark cast shadow mm -hmm. underneath the nose, which really grounds it as a form. So there are very particular things that I'm looking for. And then eventually, this is the drawing that I did during the stream. Oh my God, that looks terrible. I don't remember looking at that. <laughs> okay. Now we said earlier, if you can shoot your own photos, it's oftentimes faster and easier. And I would say as a general rule, if you can, you should. I know not everybody has access to say, Tyrannosaurus Rex, in which case you probably have to get more inventive. But if you can take a picture of it, you should. Why not? Mm, I mean, right. cats, people are so lazy sometimes. Why do you think that is? <laughs> it's just that one little extra step. And sometimes that little extra step is too much for some people. <laughs> All right, everybody, it's confession time. Okay. How many of you here, based on what you've seen, think you got to do a little more work on your references because I feel like for you, Kat, taking a reference photo, it's like an art form. And we're going to show you some examples later on. But I, I think a lot of people are very lazy about it because, again, it's like Ooh, that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Now, how about these historical images? This is from Maxfield Parrish. And he had these models and was really specific about it. Right. I mean... Maxfield Parrish's reference photos are excellent because he really goes the extra, extra, extra mile for them. So he gets them professionally done. He hires a model. He gets, I guess, as good of a quality camera as you can get during those times. And he even dresses the models in the historical clothing he wanted them to wear. Plus, he lights the setting. So this just goes to show that the more you put into your reference photo taking, the more you're going to get out of it. Like, look at these artworks. They're almost master copies of the photos, but he can say he didn't plagiarize them because they're his own photos. <laughs> I have to point out that Jason A says, Parrish went to the max. Love it. <laughs> this is great. And Kat, I will say that even though this seems like a lot of work to have to get the model and get the clothing and stage it, and Norman Rockwell, he was the king of reference photos. Like this is a very famous painting, the problem we all live with. And a lot of people don't know that he had these three little girls who modeled and had different hairstyles for them and ended up picking the one that he really liked. And, and Kat, do you see the little wooden blocks underneath the feet? Yes. Can you guess yes. why he did that? So that the pose looked more natural, so that the feet looked like they were walking. <laughs> 
Well, because if the little girl didn't have those bars, her feet would just be flat. Right. And then if you look at the painting, you lose that sense of movement. So there are these little things that he would do to change things. So obviously not everybody's gonna go to this degree, but it's like, oh man, when you get a good reference photo, isn't it amazing? Yeah, and not just one reference photo, it's great to have a variety. Great, It's great to have a selection. So not only did Norman Rockwell take pictures of three different little girls, all of their hairstyles are different. And just there are a lot of little differences in the clothing, even though they're all wearing the same dress. dress. And it's also fun to look at the props. Like, do you notice how the little girl is holding a ruler and some books? Now, in the reference photos, you see she's holding a lunchbox, but he didn't have to do that, but he did. And I do think it makes a really big difference in the final outcome. So we do have this stream that you can all watch where Kat, Lauren, and I get very specific about exactly how to shoot your own photos. But I think it's harder than people think. It doesn't sound like a big deal to shoot a photo, but this is a session I did with a model and I spent so long getting the lighting. Why does that matter? Sometimes lighting can be really bleaching. It can bleach out the image. Like what you see in the top left image, the light that falls onto the palm, you can hardly see the surface of the palm because of how white that light is. So sometimes you will have to take pictures of um, a certain lighting and then you have to keep that same pose and take different kinds of pictures of the lighting because the camera can focus on the light and really wash out the black or it can focus on the shadow and really wash out that light. And I also think people never shoot enough photos. I did a unit, I think it was my RISD sophomores in illustration on shooting reference photos. And I'd have the students bring them in and I'm like, let me see your photos. And I'm like, that's it, you took two? <laughs> I just cannot believe it. Like this photo session that I did with this model, I think I shot over the course of three sessions, I think I shot 3000 photos. I mean, oh I know God. that's obscene. Not everybody <laughs> should do that, but it's better than two. <laughs> well, it is far better than two. <laughs> Crosby says when using a reference photo for just a drawing, is it better to have one in black and white or color? That's a good question. Depends on how you want to render that image. Honestly, if it if you take that photo and you make it black and white so that you can make a black and white tonal sketch slash drawing, go for it. I mean, it'll make your life easier. I've done that because sometimes the color just gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Soyton Lee's asking, if you did photography a lot, would you get quicker at lighting setups? Actually, I think it's the opposite. I think the better you're at at lighting, the longer and pickier you get. I don't know, um, what do you think? I wouldn't know this. I'm not a professional photographer. <laughs> <laughs> now, sense. why did you pick this photo, Kat? This is from Google Images. Right, I needed a specific reference of two, get, two kids playing piggyback ride and it's the middle of the pandemic I there are no kids around <laughs> and I really and I can't have two adults play piggyback either because their proportions are all very different from a child's right so I actually had to go into google images and say kids piggyback ride and then I found this image and what's great about this image is how the girl is gripping onto the shoulders of the other child and that is what I ended up using as reference. And you know something, Kat, sometimes you discover something about your subject by taking the reference photo or finding a photo that it never occurred to you. Like, I don't know that you would have anticipated that somebody would grip somebody like that on piggyback. <laughs> I don't know, it's right. fun. I always think, oh, if I were to do that pose, how would I pose? And normally that's enough information I need. Like, oh, if I were to be piggyback on someone, I would like grab, their neck <laughs> just like grab you know around their neck but then i saw this image and i was like oh this is like a completely different kind of pose that i never would have thought of like even though grabbing around like the neck would be a natural pose it's just cooler when you see something something else that is not something you immediately think of such as the way this person grips that person's shoulders <laughs> and we have many versions of photos that Kat has done. I do lots of 
reference photo shots with models. I think you guys have seen this from my pencil drawing series. This is from our gouache tutorial and it's a whole process. It's not something that you do quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you don't begin the piece with references. Sometimes the reference photos come into the middle of the process, which is what happened here. So Kat, can you explain when the references came into play? Right. I was drawing on an art prof stream. So this is what I actually came up with it with in the first part. And when I'm in the middle of a stream like this one, I cannot just get up and take photos. <laughs> I can't just leave <laughs> and come back. So I had to just be present on the stream, finish what I could. And then afterwards, I filled in the gaps of what I was missing. Like, I'm not sure if that leather jacket functions that way. I'm not sure if that posture or that pose is natural enough. So then I went out and took my own reference photo of myself. <laughs> uh, if I were to be nitpicky about this photo, I think I did as much as I could. Like, I don't own a red leather jacket. I don't really want to buy one. That's fine. I had a fake black leather jacket. But I did try to find things similar, like there's a belt, there's a specific kind of pants, a white shirt, right? A hat, and the lightning bolts on the jacket so that I could see how the lightning bolt pattern folds with the folds of the jacket itself. But if I were to be even more picky about this reference photo, I would have had somebody else wear this outfit and take a picture of them so that the model could, so I could basically direct the model to be in the pose that I wanted. I would say in general, it's always better for you to be behind the camera when you're shooting a reference photo. Obviously, that's not always possible, but if you can, it's such a big difference because people rarely get the angle and you just think, oh, my friend, they can take the... No, they can't. <laughs> they don't know what you're looking for. They don't know that particular angle. I mean, I'm kind of amazed that this worked for you, Kat. Did you just put the camera on the timer? No, I did have somebody else take the photo and I showed them the original drawing I had and I said, direct me so I look as close to the image as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't know. I think the cutout lightning bolt is just brilliant because <laughs> some people might say, oh, that doesn't matter, but it really does. It's like a level of thoroughness. It's just another layer of convincing your audience that what they're seeing is real. I want to point out this comment by Soy Tenley that says, Kat, you should have grown a beard if you wanted to be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> if I wanted to take it the extra step, I could have maybe like drawn something on my chin or something <laughs> to show that difference of tone. Like, why not? I could. I another detail about this photo that I was pretty proud of myself with was that I did include the earbuds um, like a bolo tie going around the neck, basically. And that actually, the photo really informed the image in the end. Like even those tiny details, like the way that the, the, the headphones cast a shadow was very useful to know in my image. And then what did you do for the face? <laughs> and then as I was drawing, I was like, this totally doesn't look like Jordan. I really have to have Jordan take a picture for me. So I just hit up, I text, I texted Jordan. I was like, Hey, take a selfie in this, <laughs> in this angle, if you want to. And luckily he gave his consent. <laughs> I mean, did this make a difference in the end? Absolutely. I had the proportion of his chin so wrong before and now it's better. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany says, you all are so good at expanding on a reference photo and making it your own. I struggle with that and rely on my references too much, hoping that practice will help me over time. It's very tricky because the way I think about it, a reference photo is just raw, unprocessed visual information. And the thing is, if you just transfer that information to your painting, you're not really doing anything with it. And really the art part of it is, well, okay, let's look at the selfie of Jordan, but how do I take just what I need and put that into the piece? And oftentimes that means skipping a lot of things. Like I noticed you didn't put in the Adam's apple. It just wasn't necessary for the final illustration. Right, well, it was gonna be blocked by the leather collar anyways. So yeah, I would have to omit that. And then this is from another stream. Sometimes, as we said, you don't take a literal thing. Like this is a silly little plant 
that I saw when I was hiking, I thought they looked almost like figures. And then you ended up using them as trees, which I just love. It's so great when you take like fantasy items and you make them from ordinary things. Did you have fun with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the root of a lot of fantasy is just taking two very ordinary things and then merging them into something that's new. And sometimes a video is the way to do it. So can you explain why you shot a video for this one, Kat? Well, I shot a video because a self-timing camera was kind of much more of a hassle. Whereas if I just like put it on a video, set it live, pose it, and then just do the pose, I could just screenshot whatever pose that came to mind. Another thing that could have helped too is during the video, I would like pose in different ways and then I would take a screenshot of the exact way I wanted my hands to fold over each other. Another reason I would use video as references, as reference would be if something is in movement. Like if somebody is running, I don't want somebody to just pose still running. I would want somebody <laughs> to actually run. So then I can just screenshot whatever dynamic poses I want from that video. Did you do any Photoshop alteration in the background to make that all glowy or is that just from the video? Oh, I did Photoshop this blurry because I don't want to, I want to hide details about where I live. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you oh. did that to like do the glow in the illustration. No, but what I did do was really pump up the contrast of shadow and light. That was also, that was something I did Photoshop. I do that a lot actually, is I'll take the photo, but sometimes I wanna make the contrast more dramatic. And so I don't always do it, but sometimes a little bit of Photoshop can go a long way. Now, this is a pen and ink illustration from this comic that you're working on about antique shops. And you used tons of references for this. So can you just tell people what they're looking at? And then we'll look at the reference photos. So this is a magical library. <laughs> and this is a library setting in the antiques shop world I have created. So I wanted it to be a magical library. And the way I thought about it is like, have I been to any magical libraries before? Are there any magical library? Well, libraries that are fantastical feeling that actually exist. And I actually once was in the University of Coimbra in Portugal, and they have a fantastic library. And I don't have photos of it, but I found this Google image uh, reference for it. And I ended up using this as a reference for my own library. Yeah, and so sometimes it's a place that you've been or that influenced you. Maybe you don't have a photo of it, but you can go back and draw upon that experience because, well, it's fine, of course, to just get a photo, sometimes if you have a little bit more of a personal connection to the place, or if you understand the atmosphere of that library and why it felt magical, that can go into the piece as well. Right. So I also got these images of very standard bookstores as well, because I wanted to get sort of the feeling, the atmosphere of different book places. So it didn't just have to be a library. It could also be a bookstore. Yeah. And again, it's like those things are all sort of related and then ultimately your illustration ended up being a conglomeration of all those things put together. Right and again this is a setting in an antiques shop so I have actually gone to antique store to take antiques stores to take reference photos so I, I took pictures of these weird frames and these weird shelves and I thought hey it would be really cool to have that as a bookshelf in my fantasy library so I have combined images of places I've been, images I've just found online, and images that I've taken myself in order to create this fantastical library. It's funny to me, Kat, that you were looking at the shelves because I guess my first impulse with an antique shop is just to focus on the objects. Why the bookshelves? Because a lot of people would think, oh, well, it's bookshelves, whatever. It's the objects that matter. <laughs> well, I like to, as you said, with the nose, references. I do like to contextualize the objects because an antiques shop is not just about the objects. They're the star of the sh show for sure. But the antiques shop itself houses these objects. They are just as important as the objects themselves. So you're not just looking at objects. You're also looking at the background of the spaces. Right. The environment. And 
Kat does demonstrate her incredible <laughs> method for processing and organizing reference photos in the digital illustration tutorial, but just give people an overview of what we're looking at here. I like to take all of my reference photos and put them into one image because if I were to just like open them up on preview in my computer, I'd have to flip through so many images to find the exact one I want. Whereas if they're all put into one image, all I have to do is like drag the image around, zoom in, and then I'll find my chosen image more quickly. And so if we go back here, now you can see, as somebody said earlier, when you combine multiple photos, it's so much less likely that somebody's gonna look at this and go, oh, cat totally ripped off that person because it's this huge like smoothie <laughs> of reference <laughs> photos and like nobody would ever really know the difference. Right, I do have like a fantasy that maybe one day somebody will look at this and think, oh, that kind of looks like the library from the University of Coimbra. Like that would be so cool if somebody were to say that. But then again, it is not exactly the library from the University of Coimbra. So that's my trick. <laughs> <laughs> You're just messing with us, aren't you? <laughs> and you know something, Kat, I think it's really disappointing that a lot of artists don't show their reference photos online. And I think it's a disservice because people don't see the hard work and research that happens. A lot of people, they just show the illustration. Everyone goes, ah, but I love seeing this. It, to me, it's like understanding your brain better. <laughs> right. I agree. I love seeing this kind of stuff too. But actually, uh, since I'm relatively active on social media, I've seen a Twitter trend where artists will post the reference versus the image. And I don't know what hashtag it is, but it's actually been really enlightening to see those posts because yeah, now you can see the reference images that the artists are using. And it's just, it's really interesting and hot right now. <laughs> All right, we're gonna give some of you a couple of websites that we think might be useful for reference photos. I mean, there's so many more out there, but here are a couple that we like to rely on, like our own, the ArtProf <laughs> reference photo collection. And we have tons of photos. They're all shot by me on a DSLR camera. You can download them for free, high resolution images, and you can use them however you like. All the images are marked so that as long as you give us credit, you can use the photos in whatever capacity you want. So definitely check it out because we use them for the art alongs. And I'm so proud of my bison photos, Kat. <laughs> Everyone, please use the bison photos and appease Clara Lou. <laughs> Guys, come on. I work so hard to find these bison photos. And I just happened to walk by this like little car parade one day. Ooh. And so now there are all these photos of antique cars on the shop. <laughs> you know, one of the hardest things to draw are cars in comics. Like there have been multiple artists that say cars, crowds, horses, bikes. <laughs> these are the top four <laughs> hardest things. So Clara, now you have to take reference photos of all four of these. <laughs> well, I have cars and bikes. Okay, now you have to take pictures of the other two. <laughs> okay, I'll work on it. <laughs> I did take a lot of fish photos. <laughs> now, there's a lot of other sites like there's Croquis Cafe, which apparently they changed their name to on air video. Dot com. I was like so confused when I looked up their stuff. So they have images of nude models. I believe Line of Action has a lot of these as well. And this is a great Instagram for drawings of faces because these are real people. It's Humans of New York. It's a really popular site. It's also a book. Now maybe they have multiple books, but that's a great site for people. And movie stills are great. I don't think enough people do this. Yeah, I'm surprised. I feel like people think movie still, stills are on the same level of curation as Google Images, but I disagree because I think they do have a little bit more specificity depending on like time period, costuming, the actors and actresses. So, uh, you know, if you need to draw Jane Eyre, <laughs> you know where to look on MTV. <laughs> and actually it was Lisa H who's in the chat right now mentioned the Library of Congress has a wonderful collection of prints and photographs. And I stole that from you, Lisa, because you had posted it in the Discord. And we also have these two other streams that show more examples of different ways artists use references, not necessarily always from photos, from other resources as well. 
By the way, I want to give a shout out to Jill Kama. Thank you so much for the super sticker. We greatly appreciate your support. And remember, this Google Slideshow is available. The link is in the YouTube video description below. It's also on artprof.org under Art Resources. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Kat and I will be hanging out in the Artprof Discord. We will be in the post live streams channel so we can talk more about Kat rolling her eyes at me, which you seem to do that at least once a stream. It's like a quota for you now. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to our channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. Your support is so incredibly helpful to us staying up and running. Thank you to everybody for your wonderful comments and contributions to the discussion. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.